Hey everyone, this is Lane Houck and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Elite Junior Profiles podcast. I'm really excited about our episode today. We have a very special guest, one that I'm not even going to reveal because I'm going to let my partner Paul Peckman um, really introduce her. But Paul, how you doing? Doing great, buddy. Always glad to be here with you. Awesome. Uh, today I, I'm really excited about uh, our special guest. We have Taylor Wenskowski with us today who is a Division I women's hockey a uh, player from the University of New Hampshire and has just recently been drafted by the Boston Pride in the uh, NWHL, National Women's Hockey League. Uh, so we're really excited to, to talk about her and her path and, and uh, any enlightenment she can share on, on the younger women coming up through the ranks. Um, that's what we're going to do today. So Tella, welcome aboard. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Good. Welcome, Taylor. Congratulations on all, on all your success. I think it's, uh, it's a tremendous uh, achievement to get to the thank pinnacle you. of the women's hockey world, right? Yeah, so thank you very much. It's, uh, so t tell us the process of uh, how that went, just with the drafting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so probably about a month ago, um, some of the GMs started reaching out uh, regarding the draft coming up. Um, my mind's always been set on Boston. Um, I played uh, for the Boston Shamrocks in high school, and I always said after college, Boston's where I want to be. And having the opportunity to potentially play professional women's hockey in Boston, it was an easy choice for me to kindly say no to the other teams uh, and talk to the general manager and a bit more in the coach. Um, so I had said yes to them a few weeks ago, um, and then they did the draft this past week uh, with the announcement and everything. So women's hockey is a bit different than the men's, uh, where the boys can be drafted to any team. Um, with women's hockey, there's not a lot of money in it, so they try to take players where it's as convenient um, for them so they can play where they want and you know, still be able to live at home or in a close apartment as well, so. That's a little different dynamic, huh? Yeah, it definitely is. Hopefully in the upcoming years, it'll be a league that's sustainable enough for women to be drafted to any team or even traded and have enough money to be able to start living, um, say, I don't know, another state, like if they put a team in Florida, like the, the men's do, um, so. How different was the draft this year versus years before with it with the COVID-19 shutdowns and all that? Um, I, it wasn't a lot different just because it's not really an in-person thing um, like the men's have had in the past, uh, but they had special announcements and um, special celebrities come in and announce the draft pick. So that was really cool uh, having a different perspective. There was women in the WNBA and professional soccer players and like the MMA fighters, I'm pretty sure were in there as well. So that was pretty cool. So is that something that uh, you can see the growth of, of your league now? Because you see what happens with basketball, you see what's happened with soccer and, and how they're growing their sports. Is that what you envision? Yeah, definitely. And the NWHL has been growing um, slowly but steadily the last few years. Uh, I know last year around June, some of the girls from the NWHL uh, stepped away from the NWHL to join the PWHPA, so the Professional Women's Hockey Players Association. Um, I was kind of torn between the two leagues, to be honest, at first. Um, but I just think staying with the NWHL and their vision of, you know, they're, they're growing, they're getting insurance for the girls. Um, it's a competitive league still. And, you know, you're in it to compete with a team and hopefully win a championship at the end of the season. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. And I think it's going to be special. Uh, Boston was really strong last year. Uh, they only had one loss in the entire season and they weren't uh, able to play for the Isabel cup at the end of the season uh, due to Corona. Um, so their season was cut short, just like the NHLs and uh, many other sports as well. What was the name of the cup? Isabel Cup. The Isabel Cup. Why don't you, for all of our listeners who may not be familiar with the NWHL, 
why don't you just give us a quick overview of the league and, you know, the team makeups and things like that from what you know about it. Yeah, so there's six teams in the NWHL right now. Um, a few weeks ago, they just recently added a team in Toronto. Um, they don't have a specific name to their team yet. They're still deciding that, but there's the Toronto team, Boston Pride, um, Connecticut Whale, Minnesota Whitecaps, um, New York Riveters, and the Buffalo Buttes. So it's fairly spread along New England for the most part, and then the team out in Minnesota, and now in Toronto. So it's slowly expanding, and um, it's really exciting to grow. I got, I, I got to believe, I don't mean to cut you off, I, I, I got to believe that the growth of women's hockey in college, right, that, that there's going to be more teams. There, there's, because, you know, what, women's hockey at the national level is always very strong. The Canadian, uh, the Canadian level is always very strong. There's, there's plenty of, or, or there, I shouldn't say plenty, but there are getting to be more and more women players that can definitely make that next step. Right. Uh, and they can create more teams, I think. I think there's, there's definitely a good footprint for this to, to continue on. Right. Yeah, the screen up in the background, they have, uh, <laughs> they have my stats mixed up with a goalie, one of my friends, actually. <laughs> I just never even, like, reached out about it. I just... That's funny. So it says I'm a goalie at Mankato, but that's one of my friends, Abby. That's funny. Well, that's a, great, that's a great segue to maybe just dive into what led up to this, um, the recent, you know, with you being drafted by Boston. And so that's a, obviously a, a huge achievement. And we've got up some of your other achievements here. So why don't you give us a little background? I mean, uh, the journey is always really the interesting part of, you know, what, you know, what got you to where you're at today, but, you know, what, what were some of the highlights along the way? What are some of the things you learned along the way? Yeah, so I grew up, uh, started playing hockey in Rochester, New Hampshire for the Blackhawks. Um, and then from there, I played up from Mini Mites until the end of Squirts. Um, my peewee year, I switched to Dover Stars out of Dover, New Hampshire. Um, and then following those two years, I played at a, a higher boys team called the Seaco Spartans. So I played my two years of Bantam with them. Um, first season was eighth grade, second season was split season with high school hockey. Um, I played boys my freshman year as well uh, in high school. I played for the Spalding Red Raiders um, out of Rochester, New Hampshire as well. And that year, it was a really awesome experience. The coach I played for, uh, Coach Paul George, he was one of the hockey coaches and baseball coaches at Spalding for many years. Um, he recently stepped away, but I remember my freshman year um, workouts going to the high school to run stairs after practices or pushing his car after practice with the boys. I was the only girl on the team and they really pushed me and really took me in and, you know, they made me feel comfortable and they pushed me to be a better hockey player every day. Um, so I'm really thankful for staying with the boys as long as I could. I think their speed and physicality and strength really helped me and pushed me. And then my sophomore year of high school, I went away um, to play for the Boston Shamrocks out of Wilmington, Mass. Um, so I played there for my three years. My summer going into my junior year of um, high school, I was invited to Lake Placid for the USU 18 camp. Uh, I was 15 at the time. I, I made the team, the 22 uh, team roster. So it was awesome. We played Canada in a three game series in Lake Placid. Uh, uh, same thing the following year, um, before my senior year, I made the U uh, U18 team and we traveled to Calgary to play a three game series against Canada there. Um, so that was pretty cool getting to play with and against some of the best players my age um, back in high school. And then from there, I uh, went to UNH. I actually started going to UNH games when I was about eight or nine years old. I got season tickets for my birthday. Um, absolutely that. fell in love with the university and the, and the games. Um, some of my like, favorite role models I still talk to nowadays, uh, Sam Faber, she was awesome. She actually played for the Connecticut Whale um, for I think a season or two. Um, now she coaches, but her and then Casey Bellamy, who 
He was a three-time Olympian um, with the Team USA. So that was really, really awesome growing up, um, watching them play and see where they've made it to. Um, my sophomore year of college, I actually got hurt and ended up redshirting. So I was able to have my fifth year of hockey this past season. Um, and then my junior year of college, I think was my, was a big year for me. Um, junior I of college, off, you said? Yeah, I came off a 20 goal season, which, you know, was really awesome. Um, and I got invited to the US Women's National Team camp this past August. Um, so that was really cool and exciting experience to uh, go there. And I actually played against Casey Bellamy, uh, one of my role models growing up. And I actually was able to, I scored an overtime at that, at that camp in that game. And I just remember her coming up to me after the game and just chirping me a bit. But yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was, it was a cool experience. And the goal I scored on was my roommate at camp too. And uh, we, I, she plays for Harvard, and we played at Harvard this year, and I chirped her all game that I was going to score high glove on her, and I, I did, so it was <laughs> it was pretty funny. So That's awesome. Yeah, it was. Oh, there's it was chirping in, in women's hockey too, huh? Yeah. Oh, I'm a big chirper. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, if anyone in the league heard this, they'd, they'd probably say, yeah, they'd agree. That's great. <laughs> Gotta help oh. them with it too. So when, it's always when, you can, when you can back it up, you can talk all you want. Yeah, it's definitely fun playing friends too and being able to chirp them. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, first of all, I want to just say congratulations on just uh, a great journey, a successful one. I'm sure it has challenges too, but I, you know, I mean, you learn to appreciate those. But really, just a uh, you know, big congratulations on getting drafted by the Boston Pride and. I'm sure you're look, you. you just can't wait now. I'm sure just to get started, right? Yeah, I'm really excited and looking forward to it. What do What do you think was the, the toughest part going through your high school years, uh, getting in front of, of colleges? Uh, was that difficult? Or, or, you know, women's hockey is, is it's a different animal when it comes to the recruiting process and that kind of stuff. So... Uh, maybe enlighten us a little bit on how that how that went for you. Yeah, so moving to girls hockey, I think, was definitely beneficial. Um, I played for the club team and uh, in the JWHL, which is a pretty popular junior program, or sorry, junior league. Um, but also a lot of girls will play for uh, club teams on top of their prep schools like Acibet, Wizards, those are the local ones around Massachusetts. So that's really helpful for recruitment as well. Um, what was the also, league, Taylor? What did you say, sorry? What was the league you just mentioned? Uh, JWHL, Junior Women's Hockey League. Um, so that's, I played in that league for three years. Um, I'm not really sure how many teams are in there now, but when I was there, there's six American teams, six Canadian teams. Um, and we would travel through the US uh, and Canada to play at different college campuses. And, you know, it was highly recruited. Um, I'd, I'd suggest to any high school girls or that are trying to, you know, get to the next level to look into that league, whether it's the JWHL or uh, prep school or playing for uh, a club team that, you know, travels and has an opportunity to compete for nationals. So what, what age did you go into the JWHL? I was 14 turning 15. Um, my birthday's late September. So I was, I was pretty young, um, 14 starting my sophomore year and I was 17 starting my freshman year of college as well. Um, did you go in the U16 division then when you, when you were like 14? I played uh, U19 um, all the way through. Major junior, is that what that is? Yeah. Okay. Wow, so you just jumped right in and, and, and all right. You, so, you know, what um, What age group do you recommend, you know, that girls who are playing hockey now that they, that they look into this at the U14, get in there early or? Yeah. Um, or, you know, I mean. My, my personal opinion is if – the girls can stay with the boys as long as possible. I know hitting went from 
being delayed from peewees to bantam so they have an extra two year gap where i played boys hockey where they would hit peewee year so i had hitting for i think four years before i switched but i think if girls can hang and stay in and playing with the boys as long as possible even if it is the switch in eighth grade um before the hitting starts for them i think just playing with the boys and a, you know it's kind of a faster more physical game and i think you can use that to your advantage as well um obviously everyone's different and there's a lot of girls that have been incredibly successful playing girls hockey their whole life um, but i just found for myself that it was really beneficial for me playing with the boys as long as I could. Well, so it's always better that uh, if you're playing against bigger, stronger, faster, right? And, and, and that's that's what you're up against every day. Right. You're going to get better, right? And, exactly. and then once you make the transition over to the women's full time, uh, you're going to just leapfrog and succeed. So let, yeah, let me ask I'm you. the principle across all sports, right? I mean, no matter what sport, you just – if you're yeah. going to want to pull yourself up to the next level, then you got to play against the, the bigger, faster, stronger athletes. Right, exactly. Whether it's hockey, lacrosse, soccer, anything. Um, yeah. let, let me ask you this. What, now, when we talk, I mean, we've had our conversation, uh, you know, when we connected. And, uh, you know, I'm very adamant about the women's and, and helping women's sports and get more exposure and all this in here. What did you find uh, – very intriguing about the elite junior profiles and, and helping and how that would help girls uh, get more exposure. Yeah, I just thought it was an awesome opportunity to get their name out there and a little bit more about them, um, especially during this time with COVID-19. I think if people can, you know, sign up or get their name out there more and I know there's options for the the highlights and stuff, but I think you know, this is a really hard time, especially for high schoolers. Like my sister is a junior in high school and this was her huge um, season for lacrosse and it's canceled. Summer lacrosse is most likely canceled. So it's a tough time for kids in high school that are trying to get to the next level where coaches can't see what how they've progressed throughout the last year. Um, I think for me, going from my sophomore to my junior year of high school was a huge transition and huge game changer for me that summer. Um, so I think that's the case for a lot of people. And I know how much my sister has put in to elevate her game. And uh, now she can't show all her improvements. And, you know, I think elite junior profiles um, will be really beneficial for anyone within that age and just getting their name out there and colleges knowing more about them uh, or whether it's a kid that's looking to go into prep school um, that wasn't able to show their talent for whatever year they were supposed to be in right now. Um, I think it would be very beneficial. What have you done like along the way? Have you had to do anything to, to get you yourself out there to, to reach for the opportunities or did you find because of this the path you had that, that you were that you had scouts and people that were just actively recruiting you? Yeah, I just think based on the path I took, um, I was really set on UNH as a kid. Um, and I honestly only visited one school before I committed to UNH just because my mind was always so set on University of New Hampshire. So I, I visited Quinnipiac one weekend during our JWHL tournament because we were playing there. Um, so I talked to the coach there and a few days later I went to UNH, uh, gave a verbal commitment. Um, and then junior of high school, uh, the coach I committed to actually got fired um, mid-season. Uh, they didn't have a head coach for six months. So I kind of talked to the coaches that were there and were like, hey, you know, none of us know what's going on. They didn't know if they were staying at UNH uh, based on the new head coach that came in. They could have kept the assistants that were there, or wiped out the entire coaching staff. So it's like, hey, I'm going to explore my options. And I visited two Boston schools. Um, I was really back and forth with uh, Boston College and UNH. Um, one day I'd say, all right, BC. The other day I'd say UNH. But at the end of the day, my, my heart's always been at UNH. And, you know, looking back, I, I'm really happy with my decision. I'm still really close with the BC coaches. And they're always, they always give me a hug and talk to my parents whenever they see us. And 
they've been great. Like they know. It's awesome. Yeah, my, how I always wanted to play at UNH, and I mean, I really appreciate that, and you know, I have a good relationship with them, and that's what it's all about. I think is whether you go to a team or not, the the relationship and everything you build goes a long way, and you know, coaches might, you know, might stink that they don't get you, but at the end of the day, they do want what's best for you, and it was really awesome to see that perspective from them as well. What, uh, do you have any idea of what's going to happen or, or when they're going to start training camp or they mention anything to you about uh, uh, what the next step is? Yeah, so we start practice um, at the end of September within the, the team and the coaches. Um, we might have some captain's practices um, mid to early September. Um, it's kind of up in the air right now within the COVID-19. Um, What's the rink? The rink, uh, we play out of the Warrior Ice Arena, so the Bruins practice arena. Nice, all right, cool. Yeah. So, how, many games, how many games do you play? What's the schedule like? Uh, games are going to start in November this year. Uh, it's 20 games before playoffs. Um, it's All the games are on the weekends because most of the girls have either full-time jobs or at least part-time jobs during the week, just because um, the pay isn't sustainable enough to not have another job right now. Um, last year, uh, I think it was 24 games regular season that they played, but they're, it's going to be 20 this year. And you're not working full-time, I understand. What are you, don't you tell our listeners what you're doing? Yeah, so I'm actually joining uh these guys with the elite prospects so yeah it's just super exciting and hopefully i can help some girls or even like younger boys or guys help them get to the next level as well um and i'll also be coaching a little bit but i'm really looking forward to the opportunity to work with paul here and help some other people get to where i am today and are you you're going to school as well no, I'm finishing my master's right now, it's actually. You, so you'll, be, you'll be done this coming semester? Yeah, I have about two weeks left. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was able to get my undergrad and grad school in within my five years at UNH. So. Wow, good yeah. you. You're just a winner on all, all fronts. That's awesome. I'm trying. I just, I work hard. I think Absolutely. that's, that's well, definitely. Absolutely. Go ahead. I uh, was just saying that's definitely what's gotten me to where I am today within hockey or school is just you always have to work hard. And I think that's something I've I learned at a really young age and, you know, having good role models growing up as well. It's no substitute for hard work. No, not at all. Where do you, where do you attribute you, you learning that lesson of hard work, Taylor? Uh, to whom? You said good role models? Yeah, definitely my mom. Um, she, she works so hard. She's just so dedicated. She was a teacher for a bit. And I mean, I could just see how much she cares about her students. And now she's in a more of a principal role. And I think she misses teaching because she doesn't have as close of a connection with all the kids and students. Um, but she, I mean, she raised me as a single mom um, for a few years when she had me when she was like working full time going to school. So just seeing that and how hard she like she'll work out and she's ran I think six marathons wow. so just training for that I mean I'm not a runner I <laughs> I'll probably tap out after a 5k like three mile run and yeah she's she's crazy but yeah I'm really lucky to have her to look up to and like I said Sam Faber and Casey Bellamy growing up watching them play at UNH and yeah I'm like I said I'm still close to them and you know I've honestly talked to Sam a lot the past couple of weeks and telling her about my uh, decision and experience. And I mean, I'm hopefully able to get her number 28 um, for the pride because number 12 is taken. Um, I'm not too sure if, if number 28 is going to be signing for the pride. So if, uh, if she doesn't sign, I'm going to take that number. So 
feel like that would mean a lot for me and my family and, and even Sam as well. So racking up points despite nope, not so, I don't know what that hang on. I think the NWHL had some auto auto audio go in there. <laughs> um what's the age difference between you and was it you said Sam? Yeah, Sam Faber, gosh, she she's probably eleven years older than me. So how did you did you get to know her personally? Yeah, my sister was Sam's super fan growing up. Um my sister, gosh, was probably three or four when we started going to games and every 28th day of the month she'd go into her teachers and say it's Sam Faber day and they had no idea who Sam Faber was but <laughs> every 28th of the month it was Sam Faber day so uh, how did that happen like how did she become like this super super fan of Sam um honestly I think it was just from our interactions with Sam after games and skate with the cats Sam would always come over and give Morgan a hug and yeah Morgan fell in love with her right away and it was just it's really awesome to see that how great Sam was with Morgan. And I think that helped me, you know, seeing how good of a role model she was to now me going up after games uh, to lobby after every game. Um, I always had a lot of family being local, but even other kids that would come to watch, I'd always try to sign autographs or take pictures if they wanted it and, you know, try to help inspire the next generation, um, just like Sam did for my sister and I. I, I can tell you, you definitely have a give back, you know, um, attitude and heart and mentality. Um, and it's, it's obviously, you, you learned that from Sam and obviously it sounds like your mom too. Yeah. Um, what, what is it that you learned from Sam about hard work? Like, where did you, what, what was it that you saw in her? Or what, you know, what part of it did, did, how did you get that, you know, that, that work ethic that you saw in her? Where did you learn it? Yeah. Just watching her on the ice. Um, just always giving it her all and, you know, just the way she played, the style of play, um, you know, whether it was stealing the puck to go and score or back checking, playing good defense, or even having her teammates backs, getting into scrums. I remember seeing a scrum at UNH where I'm pretty sure it's either Sam or Casey was in a scrum and the other one pulled the other one back. It was, yeah, it, it was just funny, like looking back, because I mean, I've had my, my share of scrums and physicality but yeah well, let me ask you this that what kind of training do you guys do similar off ice training to compared to the men yeah um we lift about the same amount we just have uh different strength coaches but yeah we we lift twice a week in season um off season it's typically four um four days a week of lift and five days of workouts when we're at school right now it's it's five days right now as well three days lift two days running um but yeah it's very similar to the the regiment that that they go through you go through yeah they prepare for your season yeah exactly what advice would you give to um to parents who have girls playing hockey or girls in any sport i mean you know there's probably some general principles there but what what advice, you know, you learned some things from your mom. What advice would you kind of pass on to the parents that might be listening? Yeah, for the parents, just, you know, keep supporting your kids and don't push them too much, but push them enough where they, they believe in themselves and just keep believing them, showing them positivity and, uh, you know, just trying to provide as many opportunities for the kids that they can. Um, I know my parents sacrifice a lot for me to go play hockey uh, like my dad he was in the military for 22 years and they their shifts switched every three months from days swings to midnights and I remember my dad would work midnight shifts and you know he'd come home sleep for a few hours take me to my games and go home try to go back to sleep for a little bit before he had to go back um, to work that night and looking back I don't I mean I'd it's, it amazes me um, how much I know my family sacrificed and I know a lot of other families have sacrificed so much to get their kids to where they are. Um, so I just say like, keep believing in them and you know, any, any dream can be a reality. Like I said, when I was eight or nine, I 
told my parents I was going to play at UNH and they supported it and you know it, it could have not happened but with hard work and their their help like I was able to achieve that dream and beyond. What advice would you give to um, uh, other uh, you know girl athletes that are that want to play in college whether UNH or any college I mean you learn some things in that process I'm sure and that that's always a new process. I'm, you know, I mean, it sounded like you kind of had like the inside track because of UNH and everything. That's a little bit atypical, I would think, you know, especially for for girls who are playing in, in states where that's not a concentration of colleges that have college, you know, college hockey programs. So, you know, what do you have any advice that you'd share that you learned from your process? Yeah, I just say work hard and everything, whether it's sport or school, um, in order to get to the next level, you have to have good grades and I think looking into the college process for girls um, just because you know right now there isn't enough money to not have an outside job while playing is making sure you go to a school that has your major and what you're interested in um, and also obviously you want to play for a good program or whether it's a program that's struggling and you can help rebuild and that's kind of where I was at with UNH is I went into a team that was in the middle of rebuilding. And I think looking back and since I stepped away like a month and a half ago when our season ended, um, just knowing that UNH is in a better place from when I got there between the record and even the culture within the team. Um, I think that's the most important thing is, you know, making everyone feel comfortable and welcome and accepting everyone for who they are and, you know, just supporting each other and having each other's backs. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're very proud of you. We're very excited about what the future holds for you. And, uh, you know, Lane, you got you got anything else you want to add before? Uh... Yeah, I also, I, I was, I, when, before we, we started this uh, today, Taylor, Taylor and I were just talking and she said she was, she was getting her master's degree in kinesiology. Yeah. So how have you been able to apply anything that you've learned in your master's program to, you know, just in terms of the athletic side and what you're doing and. Yeah. So my undergrad was in psych and now I'm finishing my master's in kinesiology, um, more of a sports psychology mentality. Um, my, my master's project is making a sports psychology journal for in this case um, is a women's ice hockey player. Um, so being able to take, you know, all the research from goal setting, imagery, uh, mental talk, or not mental talk, self-talk, sorry. Um, just taking that from what I'm learning and even incorporating it into my own game. Um, I think that's been very beneficial for me. And I mean, I'm really excited for once my journal's done, I'm gonna share it with uh, a lady that works at Boston Children's who I'm going to go shadow um, once all of this is over because I think it would be awesome to get into something like mental skills training and help athletes as well. So that's something I, I want to do in the future, whether it's coaching or going that route of the mental skills training. I found out I can probably get away with mental skills training without going back to school. So I wouldn't be a sports psychologist, but more of a, a mental skills coach. So it's great news on um, no more no more school hopefully yeah. so did you did you listen to our previous episode with dr kevin willis i did not actually um I i've been cannot, really caught yeah, up trying to finish my, uh, i'll have to give a listen then you, go, yeah, you would definitely dig what he's doing you guys definitely need to talk for sure yeah that would be I'll awesome make sure and introduce taylor to dr willis and um yeah that'd be great so um, maybe just give us a little bit extra, like take one of the one or two layers off the onion and talk about what you learned. And you talk about imagery and goal setting and things like that that you were, you know, are part of that. But how have you actually applied that to your game and how do you think it's helped you? Yeah, I've used imagery a lot. Um, I even remember my coach, my Pee Wee year, um, playing at Dover, she would have us before games do the like the triangle and just envision for like about three minutes about what we want to do in the game and just imagining yourself doing it off the ice um, and building that confidence in order to do it on the ice. And I, that's something I luckily learned at an early age. So before games, I'll be taping my stick and 
sit in a seat and look onto the ice and just kind of zone in on what I, I want to do that day, whether it's you know, scoring goals or imagine myself making a great back check to get the puck um, or even a good pass to my teammate back door or blocking shots. So that's something I learned at a young age that's really helped me. Um, and also the self-talk piece, just trying to let mistakes go. Everyone makes mistakes in games. No one's ever going to be perfect. Sidney Crosby, McDavid, they're not perfect. The, they make mistakes too. And it's kind of just knowing that once you get done with that shift, you got to let it go and move on to the next shift. And you can't dwell on the mistakes. You have to live in the present and go from there. So you Mindset, accept, right? Yep. So you accept that, that, you know, that mentality as truth. And then you just self-talk yourself. If you, if you feel like, do you have something that triggers? Like if you have a bad shift, you literally just walk yourself through that. You, you just talk yourself through that, that principle or conviction. Yeah, um, I work with the, one of the sports psychs at UNH and we kind of came up with this phrase of just play. So it's to not overthink of what I do or worry about the past. It's just every time I step on the ice, I try to think just play. So don't hold the stick too tight. Don't worry about making a mistake. Just go out there and, you know, I've played hockey for, gosh, 16 years. So I know the fundamentals and I've practiced enough where I just need to go out there and know I can do it rather than, you know, worrying about mistakes. And that's helped me in big games too, I think as well. Just going out there. And are you a, a leader by example or are you a, uh, somebody that's very vocal? Um, I'd say more of example, um, just especially within like practice and workouts, just going out there and having high intensity and pushing other players. Um, I'm vocal when I need to be, but yeah, I'm not really one of the, the crazy vocal people before games either. I kind of like to keep my, my headphones in and, you know, focus and visualize, so. Have you taken a disc test or a, a assessment or something like that in, in the past? I have not, no. Well, yes, they got to get her, get her a disc assessment, Paul, so she can find out what her character and personality profile is like. Yeah. I would, I would bet she's in the D section. You think she's in the D section? <laughs> yeah. Very so, assertive. You're very assertive. You, you think you're assertive. You, you sound like the, you, you mentioned scrums and chirping, so. <laughs> yeah, I can be assertive. <laughs> Telltale signs there. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, so, um, I mean, those are great insights. I'm glad we, we, we just, um, we, we went into the kinesiology and all that. That's a really, I bet that has helped you a lot. I mean, I could, I mean, the, the, we, when we were talking with Dr. Willis uh, the, in the last episode, um, he said he asked every player, like, you know, what percentage of the game is physical? What percentage of the game is, is mental? And he said in 20 some years, he's never got anyone to say it's less than, 50% mental. He's like, usually people will say 60 or 70% mental. You know, the rest is, is physical. I asked my, my 19 year old what he thought. And he said, it's 90% mental and 10% physical. Yeah. During my, I was reading some things earlier, actually, where some sites like the older um, journal articles said 50%. And I was reading something on Michael Jordan about how he practiced his imagery and everything. And I think it was by Dr. Brown uh, in 2003 even was saying that it was, it's about 90% mental, 10% uh, physical. And that's kind of where we're at with, within the world of sports psychology and how important the mental game is. Um, whether it's <laughs> confidence or uh, even like the arousal piece of their heart rate and everything like that, if you're super anxious or yeah. Your heart's pounding before games, you know, you want to bring that down, whether it's listening to music or whatever you got to do to. Isn't it amazing that we know it's, let's say, 80, 20, 90, 10 mental, mm -hmm. right? Every sport, especially at your level, right? But how many people actually train the mental part of it? I was just going to say, how many, what, what's the, how much yeah. time are we really spending? Because that takes practice, that imagery the mental rehearsing, the visualization. I mean, that actually- Most people don't, don't train that and they don't know how. Most yeah, exactly. Don't. How did you learn how, Taylor? 
Um, I had a few, at, when I played at the Shamrocks, we had a couple of meetings within um, mental training um, and I really enjoyed it. So I mean, I've done my own research throughout the years and going to USA hockey camps, we had the same thing. Um, we didn't really necessarily have anything at UNH, but there was a sports psychologist available if people wanted it. Um, I mean, I met with him for throughout my five years there. Three of the but five years, you said? What'd you say, sorry? For three of the five years? You met all, all five, since my first year. Wow. Yeah. So you just took advantage of it. Yeah. I mean, it's something I've always been really interested in, so it, I never really thought twice about going or not. You know, like coach you talked to you did not take advantage of it? Yeah, I mean, I definitely took advantage of it. There's some other players on my team that would as well. Um, but I think if more players took advantage of it, it would definitely help their game as well. Hmm. So yeah. I'm glad we went off of that little journey there. That was awesome, Taylor. Yeah. Well, and congrats on that, too. Uh, I didn't I didn't realize when we were talking earlier that you, you were actually almost done with your, uh, yeah. your Masters. So that's... That's a real accomplishment too, man. It's a great year of success for you. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. And so obviously the hard work is paying off. Yeah, I'd say so. It's exciting though. It's awesome to see the results of the hard work and everything as well. Absolutely. Do you feel like the current, the current levels of you know, the current success with the draft and with the master's degree, I mean, is that you attribute that to a certain period or just the whole all the lessons you've learned kind of just accumulating over time? Or do you feel like there was a chunk of time where you really learned some big lessons that really catapulted you to where you're at today? Um, I feel like it's all kind of added up. Um, and then moving away um, for high school, I think that was a big piece of it as well because I had to switch from normal in-class schooling to online school. So I really had to train myself to make sure I manage my time and get my homework done. And so now the online school, the, the COVID is, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too worried about it just because I've done online school before, but that was something I really had to work hard at and focus on because it was a lot more of teaching myself rather than being in class all the time. Um, so that's honestly one thing that really, I think helped me as well within the hard work, time management, and just yeah what age did you move away 14 to go to shamrocks so so you I, look back at that and that's a pile was a positive lesson for you i mean moving moving away from home and just the, all the lessons you learned as a result yeah that was a big time for me i moved away when i was 15 i went away to prep school and, and, and i think uh prep school back then was the big way to go to college like juniors was really a thought. So, uh, and, and it helps, you know, being able to handle your academics and your athletics. So uh, it, it gives you that kind of bonus. Yeah, I felt like I learned the balance before I got to college where some kids may have had a struggle when they got to college, just trying to balance that with the social life. But I was able to, you know, get my work done and I see that now, you know, coaching at Elon, we get a lot of guys from the Northeast, you know, a lot of high school kids that come in, and then all of a sudden, right, they have no idea how to handle all this, and they got all this freedom. They have, you know, now they got to worry about their classwork and all that stuff, and they kind of drift through all this. Uh, it's very difficult if you don't have that kind of background. So I right. think it's very important. Um, good for you. Good for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I also just want to, I think, you know, another thing I noticed about you is you're very humble. And I see that in, in almost everyone who's successful in a, as an athlete or even professionally, there's a level of humility that they have. They're just constantly a learner. And I think there's a constant, an, another concurrent theme, which is just hard work. You know, they're, they're always learning, which means you, you need to be humble. If you're never, if people who don't, you know, aren't humble, just, it's like they just, they stop learning, right? At some point, and, and that, that pride feeds the, 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 the thinking or the thought process that I don't need to learn, but people who are humble learn. And then there's the theme of hard work. So, um, you know, those are great lessons that we can definitely learn from your story too. So thanks for sharing that for sure. Yeah, no problem. Well, I'm looking forward to watching you play this coming season. Um, um, 
you know, this is uh, it's going to be fun. Is it so? Is it does the season start a little bit later than than typical? Yeah, we're going to start in November this year. Um, in the past, they pretty sure they started in October. Um, what kind of network is going to carry the games? You know, uh, that? it's they're always streamed on Twitch online. Um, I know they started that partnership last year, and I'm assuming they have it again this year. And I don't know if they're aired on TV or anything yet, but hopefully this year, within the next few years, they're able to get on TV and, you know, get more attention and draw some more people into women's hockey as well. I wonder if hockey TV will stream it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting big too, so. Yeah. Well, let's make sure that we put the word out there and uh, continue to grow the sport. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Well, we're looking forward to working with you at Elite Junior Profiles as well and just helping, you know, other female athletes, you know, especially. I mean, we really want – we have – I mean, Paul mentioned it, but we really have a passion to get as – help as many, you know, female athletes achieve their dreams, of, you know, get college and, you know, um, get them the exposure that they deserve um, and just, uh, you know, help them along the way in whatever way we can. I know you're – that's – you've obviously got that give back mentality, so – I'm sure you're going to have a huge impact on, on a, a whole legion of girls that are coming up. Yeah, I hope so. I feel like that would be really awesome because um, I know people have helped me get to where I am today. And, you know, it's awesome to have the opportunity to help other people reach success and hopefully make their dreams come true as well. And we just had another, have you met Kelly yet? Kelly Marks, who we uh, had on, on a podcast a couple weeks ago, um, the field hockey player. I have not, no. Yeah, so that'll be a couple things we can do, Paul, when we finish is make sure we get um, Taylor connected to Dr. Willis and the Kelly. Um, okay. You know, I mean, those are – that's what that's also what's a cool thing is as, this, as Elite Junior Profiles is growing, so is the network. And, you know, as you've already just kind of come – I mean, one of the, the things we've learned just talking to you today is, at you know, the relationships that you establish along your journey and how those relationships – have impacted you, helped you be successful, and now you're starting to do the same thing. And so building a network of other people around uh, around us is really, um, you know, kind of just, I, and then it's been a, just a fringe benefit, I think, of, of getting out there and doing what we're doing with Elite Junior Profiles is we're meeting some really, really fantastic, talented people and, and just being able to connect people as well in, in that process. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, thanks for your time. Paul, anything you want to say in closing? No, oh, again, just congratulations. Uh, you've earned it. And uh, we're looking forward to, to watching and, and watching your, your continued success in your seasons and, uh, and looking forward to going to work with you here and, and helping the sport grow. Awesome. Thank you. I'm really excited as well. Congratulations again on the draft. That's awesome, Taylor. All right. Have a good day. Talk to you soon.